Blessed are those who are generous because they feed the poor. Proverbs 22, 9. This is the key verse for a growing ministry that is committed to feeding God's children, those who are hungry in body and spirit. A ministry that began in the United States when several people came together to help those in need, both domestically and internationally. Stay tuned to hear more about the mission of a ministry called Feed My Starving Children.
My name is Karen Ill, and you are watching Everlasting Love TV. Um, thank you so much for that beautiful music. I hope you enjoyed it. And I want you to know that we are committed to glorifying God by demonstrating how He is at work in individual lives and around the world. Let me start by inviting you to contact our team either by phone or through our website. Um, if you'd like to comment on an interview or if you need prayer, we would just love to connect with you. So our phone number is 773-286-2172 or you can connect with us on our website at www.everlastinglovetv.com. In 1 John 3.18, it says this, Little children, let us love, not in word or in speech, but in truth and action. Well, on tonight's program, um, I'm happy to tell you that we will see the love of God at work through his servants at Feed My Starving Children. They celebrated 25 years of ministry last year in, in 2012, which is cause for a great victory celebration. And I'm very pleased tonight to introduce you to Josh Rocket, who is the site supervisor at the Schomburg, Illinois facility, and one of his key volunteers, Suzanne Henry. It's really a pleasure um, to meet you both, and I welcome you to our show. Thanks. I'd like to start out our conversation tonight, if you wouldn't mind. We'd love to just get to know a little bit about each of you. So Josh, we'll start with you. If you could just tell us a little bit about who you are and maybe your life journey, um, what, what led you to Christ in your life? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, as you said, my name is Josh Rocket. I, I'm originally from West Michigan, so I grew up in a little town called Holland, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And um, I was born and raised in a, in a Christian family there, and uh, I'm very involved in church and ministry uh, growing up. Graduated from Holland Christian High School, um, in 2002 and uh, began to attend college at uh, Grand Valley State University. Uh, while I was there I switched majors probably about six times and <laughs> had no idea what I wanted to yeah, do. That um, <laughs> yeah and uh, eventually I, uh, I took a semester off and um, started painting houses full-time with a friend of mine named Jason and uh, and during that time Jason was helping out with a ministry um, at a, a youth group at a local church and there were some kids who were a little a little rowdy, a mm -hmm. little um, causing trouble, and uh, Jason kind of took these kids under his wing and um, started kind of a separate ministry for them. They began meeting on a different night during the week, and um, and he uh, the ministry grew from like 10 kids to about 40 in a couple weeks. Wow. And he, he uh, just said to me, Josh, I need some extra muscle. Will you uh, <laughs> will you show up and and help out? And um, and so he started a ministry that was called Golgotha, and it was it was. Um, it was towards at risk. It was kind of focused at at-risk kids in West Michigan. Mm -hmm. A lot of them dealing with addiction or homelessness or or other issues um, that might go unnoticed mm -hmm. um, in teenagers. And so, so I started helping out with that ministry in it. And when I did, that's kind of when I felt the calling and knew kind of what I wanted to do. Um, I, I knew I was kind of called to ministry, maybe not in the church setting, but maybe outside of it, working mm -hmm. with with a kind of different population of um, maybe youth, maybe not, and uh, transferred to Kuiper College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, where I got a degree in youth ministry and biblical studies. Uh, and then I moved down to the Chicagoland area and worked as a juvenile detention officer for about uh -huh. three and a half years. So I worked with kids in jail. I um, helped do some, uh, some group therapy sessions in, in jail, some counseling, um, ran the art and recreation program and um, Wonderful. did that for about three years and then um, felt the call to continue my education in ministry and um, enrolled at North Park Theological Seminary mm -hmm. on the north side of Chicago yep. and got a Master's of Divinity there. And, um, but during my time there, I had started working part-time for Feed My Starving Children. Uh, just uh, kind of as a part-time job in school. Mm -hmm. um, but as I became more, more involved, um, I really just fell in love with the organization, fell in love with what they were doing, yeah. uh, feeding God's starving children, hungry in body and spirit um, around the world, and, and also just their, their outreach to, um, to, to people in the community and connecting, connecting them, kind of like the passage you read from 1 John to, to action in mm -hmm. term in, in regards to their faith and uh, you know as you're studying in seminary you just can't ignore the 2,000 plus passages of scripture that speak about helping the poor and the needy and right. and I just felt really called to this 
to, to the ministry of FMSC and, um, and eventually became the site supervisor of our Schomburg location mm -hmm. and have been there for about three years now and have, and have really loved it. Oh, so. that's great. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Absolutely. A lot of us take detours in college and, yeah. and God is preparing us for something and mm -hmm. you, you built the good foundation and mm -hmm. that's great. Heard God's voice and calling you here. And Suzanne, would you like to share with us too? We'd love to hear um, just how, how God has worked in your life and what's brought you to, to this point. Sure. Um, I was very fortunate. I was born in a large family uh, with good Catholic values. We attended uh, Catholic grammar schools mm -hmm. and high schools. Um, there was a lot of love, um, education at home, um, mm -hmm. always talk about God and um, you know how we should be acting like Jesus in our lives. Um, after I graduated high school, I went off to college, um, became a little more independent, mm -hmm. as some people do at that time. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, but I came back after I graduated, and I began teaching at a Catholic school. And I wanted to um, be a good example for the high school students. I was a young girl in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And um, after I was married, um, I think that was the most important uh, time in my life where God was at the highest importance because I also wanted to give my children um, the good Catholic um, religious education and values that I was brought up with. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually my children um, led me to volunteering at Feed My Starving Children. And um, soon after that, I was working there as a team leader with Josh as my supervisor. So That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's so neat to see how God works in our lives. Um, and, and it's just a pattern that follows to serve him and love him. And, and so you both ended up at Feed My Starving Children, which we would love to talk to you about tonight. So um, maybe, um, Josh, you could give us a little bit of background about what Feed My Starving Children actually is and, sure. and what it does, a little bit of the history. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Feed My Starving Children started about 25 years ago, like you mentioned. We celebrated our 25th anniversary. Um, it was started um, by a man from Minnesota, a businessman, who had gone on some mission trips down to to Honduras and uh, just in the process witnessed poverty mm -hmm. and, and hunger and starvation among children and felt God ca calling him to feed his starving children. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he came back to the States and um, eventually uh, in 1987 started Feed My Starving Children. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after he started it, they, they were searching for food formulas, what can, we, what can we send that, you know, will make the trip, will last, will be uh, full of nutrition that these kids, these kids need. Most of them um, are pretty undernourished and, mm -hmm. and uh, need something very nutritious. And so what's kind of universal, what will be good? And he worked with food scientists from Cargill, Pillsbury, General Mills, and they developed a formula that we um, eventually call our Mana Pack Rice, mm -hmm. um, which we have here. Here's yeah. a packet of it. So um, this is called our Mana Pack Rice, and there's four ingredients in it. Um, vitamins, veggies, soy, and rice. The vitamins is, uh, it's kind of a powder. It has 20 vitamins and minerals in it. Mm -hmm. Power pack blend of 20 vitamins and minerals. Um, the, it tastes like chicken too. It's a completely vegetarian meal. It tastes like chicken. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. it, uh, but it's kind of has a chicken flavoring to it. We mm -hmm. used to call it chicken. We have since switched it to vitamins because it is completely vegetarian. There's a lot of vegetarians in the world and we want to make sure everyone can eat this food. Oh, so even though it tastes like chicken, it's not chicken broth mm -hmm. or bouillon or something. There's in no there. chicken in it. It's actual vitamins, yes. but it has a, a flavor. Okay. Yep. So the vitamins, uh, veggies provide some, uh, some color, some flavor, some more nutrients to the food. Uh, soy, mm -hmm. it's a, a textured mm -hmm. soy protein. Mm -hmm. So it provides protein. And then rice, and rice is um, provides carbohydrates. It, it's also what we like to call universal food. I mean, you can send rice pretty much anywhere in the world, and people uh, will know what it is, and they'll know how to cook it. Mm -hmm. So it's widely accepted. So it was a, a perfect formula um, for for us and for um, what we wanted to do. And so. Um, so this formula was developed, and then they, they began packing it. They started off with machines. It wasn't very cost effective to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, they began pa packing with volunteers um, in the 90s and, right. and eventually um, had an all volunteer packing process. And uh, Which is the system that still works today, We still right? use it today. It's yeah. all packed by volunteers, yep. and it's a wonderful, ex wonderful experience. It is. I, I've, I've had the pleasure of doing that twice this year myself, and uh, we're just really excited for the process and for what happens at the packing sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a yep. lot of people cheer vitamins, veggies, soy rice as they pack. We make it a lot of fun. So. Mm -hmm. uh, 
around uh, around 2003, we were we we had were producing about three million meals a year, and that had been kind of consistent. And and the organization was um, wasn't really growing, wasn't sure the direction it was going to head. Mm -hmm. uh, and up until that point, we had. Uh, we were a Christian organization, but we didn't speak about it too much, um, just in hopes of maybe getting um, more donations from, from corporations and, and things like that. Uh, but in 2003, it, um, some very wise people on the board decided to rededicate the organization to Christ. And uh, we hired a new CEO. And so in 2003, we packed three million meals. And, and since then, since our rededication, uh, the number of meals we've packed has just increased almost like a hockey stick just straight <laughs> up it's this past year we did 163 million meals wow. so so 10 in a 10 year span we went from 3 million meals to 163 million meals after our rededication to Christ and we've wow. grown from a site in Minnesota to now seven sites across the country um, three in Minnesota three in the Chicagoland area mm -hmm. one in Tempe Arizona and uh, then about a quarter of our meals to a third are packed with something called mobile pack, where we take all our, all our ingredients, all our tables and funnels and scoops and scales, and we throw it in a semi and go all around the country and set it up in churches or schools and gymnasiums and, and wow. pack the food there. Incredible. So, mm -hmm. And you mentioned that there are three Chicagoland locations. Would you tell us where those are since we're taping here in Chicago? Absolutely. Yeah, there is uh, uh, Aurora. Mm -hmm. That's uh, been around for five or six years. It's our, it's our oldest Chicagoland site. So okay. Aurora, Schaumburg, which is the one where I'm the supervisor at. We've been around for three years. We just celebrated our third anniversary a couple weeks ago. So, and Libertyville. Libertyville is our newest site. They've been open um, a little less than a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're our newest site here in the Chicago lands. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. that's the one I have visited myself. Mm -hmm. And Suzanne, you were he had mentioned um, Josh had mentioned the mobile packing sites. Mm -hmm. um, I think is that how you you got your introduction to feed my starving children? Um, yes, it was right around 2005. The Aurora facility was open, but that was quite a distance from our home. Um, and my daughter was attending college at Elmhurst College. And she was so excited, she called me up one day and said, Mom, I saw these Feed My Starving Children trucks on campus. Something's going on. Um, or unfortunately, she was a sophomore, and they were doing a mobile pack for the freshman oh. orientation. So she didn't get to participate, but we were aware of the organization and the wonderful things they were doing throughout the world. Um, and she was excited to get involved in it at that point. Um, one of the things I wanted to add about what Josh was saying, um, along with packing more and more meals, how much we've um, been able to increase at Feed My Starving Children, um, UNICEF does a study on how many children are starving throughout the world. And it was a very sad statistic, um, 18,000 children each and every day dying of starvation in the world. Oh. And that is horrendous since there's enough food in the world to, to feed everyone. Right. Um, well, with our increased meals and along with many other humanitarian organizations, mm -hmm. that number has now come down to 6,200. Wow. So, wow. so mm -hmm. we're hoping to keep chipping away yes. at that. That's mm -hmm. huge improvement, isn't yeah. it? I mean, and that each one of those numbers represents a child. Exactly. It? Mm -hmm. Represents a child. Yes. And we were when we were talking a little earlier, we we were kind of talking about the distinction between children who are maybe undernourished and people who are malnourished, and those who are on the brink of starving. Can you speak a little bit to that and, and why the focus of Feed My Starving Children is what it is? Sure. Yeah. We. Um, yeah. There's a difference between being hungry yes. and and you know and being and being starving or being malnourished and right. and um, you know we've probably all experienced you know hungry you know being hungry you yeah. know you don't you you skip lunch or something and you feel right. a little hungry um, but being starving being undernourished being malnourished is a, is a, is a totally different thing your body is not getting the nutrients it it needs um, sometimes systems are shutting down sometimes um, as as Sue mentioned, you know, that a lot of death is caused by hunger-related causes, yeah. 6,200 kids each day. And so, so Feed My Starving Children exists to, to reach those kids. To reach those kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe some that haven't had a meal for several days. Mm -hmm. Or if, if you don't show up with your mana packs, who knows? Or I think you were saying to me, Sue, earlier too, it could be someone who's choosing between feeding one of their children and not the other because there isn't enough to go around. So those are the, those are the regions that you're targeting most, is that right? Yes, yeah. another uh, common thing I became aware of is the uh, um, dirt biscuit, that parents actually um, feed their children dirt biscuits because they have absolutely no food to give their children. And 
Um, they do that because they're good parents and they want to fill their kids' tummies so they can sleep at night and not have those hunger pains. Mm -hmm. But that's, we all know, a terrible food source. Right. And that's why, you know, the people that do receive our food and are in such desperate need, yes. this is really a gift from God for them. Yes, mm -hmm. it yeah. is. And it's a way that we can show, that you show God's love, right, in action because this is their deepest need. And so you speak through, through, uh, through the food mm -hmm. to, to reach their hearts. It's an incredible ministry. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so let's talk about the volunteers a little bit. Um, obviously, if, if, all, if all the food is being packed through volunteers, how, how are we reaching enough volunteers to come and help? Want to talk to us about that process a little bit? Sure, okay. yeah. We've, um, we, we, our volunteers are wonderful, mm -hmm. first of all. They're, they're the kind of the hands and feet of the organization. We couldn't do anything without them. Um, I believe we had 600,000 plus volunteers across the organization wow. last year. Wow, that's and amazing. And what I think the cool, the cool part is, is half of them are under 18. Mm -hmm. So you get, you get a lot of kids coming in and volunteer. So yeah. they're introduced to issues of, of hunger and starvation and poverty. Right. And that is a really, really neat thing, um, thing to do. And people come from all different backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, different ages, different um, groups come together to pack together. And it's a really neat aspect. And so, so yeah, volunteers, um, a lot of times they're, they're churches or their youth groups or their Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or their schools or they're just individuals or, or mm -hmm. families or whoever mm -hmm. wants to come can come. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they sign up through our website. There's a, a registration process there and they can reserve a spot there. Most of our sites are open six days a week. Um, the Liberty Bill site is a little newer and so I think they're only open three or four days a week right now. Okay. Um, so Monday through Saturday, uh, most of our sessions are in the evening. Uh, it's either an hour and a half or a two hour session um, and you, you can come in and, and pack food with us. Yeah, and so. So I, I know that was the way I was introduced to it, a group from church. You know, we're all signing up to go on a Wednesday night and it was a great fellowship building thing and it was a way mm -hmm. to give back to the community. I know when we, we were visiting the Libertyville site a few weeks ago, there was a boy who was having his 11th birthday and he wanted to have his birthday at Feed My Starving Children. Mm -hmm. So all his friends came and they were wearing their their hair nets and uh, instead of gifts they, they brought donations for Feed My Starving Children and they mm -hmm. all packed together and I thought oh my gosh because kids get it don't they? They don't like to think about kids across the world who are starving mm -hmm. yeah. and they want to do something. It compels them to do something and uh, that's probably one of the reasons the Lord told us to become like a little child because <laughs> Kids get it, don't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's rewarding for them. They feel like they're making a difference. They're doing their part. Right. You know, it's, n it's a great lesson for kids that it's not all about me, me, me. Mm -hmm. And I, that's one of the things I enjoyed about working um, as a team leader. The volunteers were so diverse. Um, mm -hmm. One time we had a 94-year-old woman come in with her grandchild, and we have a sit-down job. They can label bags. Oh, so fun. we have people with disabilities mm -hmm. um, just wanting to give to people that are worse off than themselves. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a great thing for all ages. We take kids uh, five years and up so families can come with their younger children and pack together. Yeah. So it's really heartwarming. It is. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And um, Josh, you were talking about all the ingredients, and I know just from being there myself, we have like, you have huge stations yep. and a lot of times it'll have the name of a country over the station mm -hmm. and and people come with you know someone's doing the scoop job and mm -hmm. so you want to talk to us about about that little process yeah absolutely it's really cool. Every, everyone gets a job so there you scoop in the the four ingredients the vitamin the veggie the soy and the rice mm -hmm. um, so you normally have two people scooping one person holds the bag on the funnel um, while they scoop, then weighs it and make sure there's the, the right amount of ingredient in there. We mm -hmm. adjust it if need be. Uh, and then someone seals the bag. And then um, once we get 36 bags, it's 216 meals. We put it in a box, and then the table as a whole has to come up with a, with a cheer with to a cheer. celebrate. Yes, that's that when the pack. cheers go up. <laughs> that's when the cheers go up. So there's music playing, everyone's yes. cheering. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a good experience. Um, it's a good experience as it well. Is. So yeah, but and like Sue said, we have sit-down jobs. If, if people um, need to sit down um, for an extended period of time, um, they can label some bags for us, which is a, a great job. And we also have a, a warehouse crew job if, if people want a little more exercise, mm -hmm. um, running around, picking up the boxes, refilling rice bins with our 
big bags, 2,000 pound bags of rice we have. And yeah. uh, so there's something for everybody and, and it's a, yeah, it's a All great right. experience. So if someone wanted to volunteer, they could go to your website. So let's give the web address. It's www.fmsc.org. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's a, a, a place there that volunteers can go and actually sign up electronically. And do they sign up in groups or individually? I've done both. Uh -huh. um, I've gone with, uh, for the very first time I went, I went with my daughter and my son, so just the three of us. Mm -hmm. um, we went on the website. It's very easy to uh, work your way through the pages. You mm -hmm. choose the date. You choose the time. Mm -hmm. um, if there's not enough spots open, you can easily look at um, different options. Um, and we went to the event and didn't know anybody else. Um, got paired up with um, some other people bonded very quickly. Everybody is there for the same cause. Right. Very friendly, very fun. Mm -hmm. um, had a great time. Couldn't wait to get back. Um, we now do a yearly event um, for my daughter's um, birthday. And um, so we have 90 people. We take up the whole session. Mm -hmm. And I manage uh, the reservations with the group. So I um, block off that 90 people for that session for our group. And then mm -hmm. um, I send out, actually, I put the email addresses into um, the website. Oh. And they email um, the different people. Volunteers. And they all sign up. And, and that's also a great way to do it. So we have a lot of corporate organizations um, that do group things. Um, we love to have them come in mm -hmm. um, because that spreads the word um, more and more throughout the communities. Yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just so so cool the way mm -hmm. the whole yeah. the whole thing works. Okay, so tell me some a little bit then about how you feel the gospel is advancing as the result of of what's happening at the sites. We we talked about um, the roots of the the organization. You went back to your Christian roots, and and now. Um, you're reaching out to different countries. So, well, maybe you should tell me which countries, where where are we going now with, with food at this time? Sure, you know? yeah, we send our food to about 70 different countries oh, right 70. now. 70 mm -hmm. different countries. So, um, one of our biggest ones is Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, Nicaragua is up there, Kenya. Um, I know this morning I just loaded a container to go out to Somalia, and we got one going out to the Philippines tomorrow. Okay. Um, so, so, so they all go over. all over, yeah. yeah. And uh, we partner with um, incredible organizations who are already in these countries who are doing wonderful work in terms of um, health care, education, small business development, um, evangelization, um, mm -hmm. everything within their communities. They know the kids that need the food the most. They know the best way to get it to them. And then we give them the food. And the food acts as a as a catalyst really it's mm -hmm. the it's the first step towards development towards their um, introduction to the gospel. They no longer have to worry about um, about survival. being about survival yeah, yeah essentially yeah. and they um, they can be open to um, yeah to to what the wonderful work these organizations in these countries are doing so the food is kind of a first step mm -hmm. um, towards their hearing of the gospel and yeah. and and that ministry as well wonderful so um, how there's an or there's a, a system in place then to connect you in these and all the different foreign uh, countries. Yes, yeah, our yeah, partners uh, our partners fill out a food aid application and mm -hmm. go through a go through a process, um, and we see if it's a good fit um, for us to to give them food, mm -hmm. and if we feel like it is, um, then we do. And then so so each year they they submit a request for how much food they would like to receive, and then we mm -hmm. allocate it based on. Um, a system that I don't know too much about, okay. but <laughs> they, they do a great job with yeah. it. Our partners are, are the best. I can't speak yeah. uh, highly enough of them and the work they're doing. But it really does take hand-to-hand um, uh, -hand, um, cooperation within the body of Christ, within organizations that are here in the United States and in the foreign countries. And mm -hmm. it, it's a network, right, that has built um, to mm -hmm. really meet the needs of, of the kids. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So. Um, uh, what was I? So, tell, can you tell me a little bit about how your um, funds are being raised? Like, like where does the where does the funding come from to support the mission? Yeah, our, our funds come through um, through our volunteers. Um, essentially, through all our mainly our major donors are individuals, mm -hmm. people who come and and pack our food. Mm -hmm. So, it's twenty two cents provides one meal. Um, so. Pretty much anyone can give and help provide, mm -hmm. help provide food. Ninety-two percent of all our donations go directly into the feeding program. Um, we've been rated a four-star charity by Charity Navigator. I believe it's seven years in a row now. Oh. So, so um, it's a yeah, great endorsement. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. So, uh, so all, yeah, it's all our fundraising is really done by our volunteers. Um, 
and and they do private a great donors. job with that. Yeah, private donors, churches, um, and so yeah, twenty two cents per meal, about eighty dollars is is enough food to feed a child for a year so wow. your money goes a long way and yeah. you see where it goes when you come into pack as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah they have great videos and pictures and everything that they get get people behind the vision mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Suzanne talk to me a little bit more about how um, feed my starving children has impacted you just personally even and and in your family sure it, yeah. sure I'd like to share my story I have a picture here of my daughter um, this is Megan Lynn Henry my daughter mm -hmm. and um, she is a very special child of God. Um, when at a young age, her and my niece uh, talked about being missionary nuns, <laughs> you know, and we kind of joked about it, but they would have done it together. Um, and then she went on to high school and got in the youth group at our church. She went on a mission trip in West Virginia. Um, she always wanted to help others. Um, she used to um, take all her money and give it in the little uh, donation box at Lent, um, you know, for the poor. And then she wouldn't have money for what she needed, and she'd ask my husband, <laughs> he's like, what happened to the money? So she was always giving to others. Um, but unfortunately, when she was a junior in high school, um, she got a very rare childhood cancer called Wilms tumor, mm -hmm. and it's a cancer of the kidney. Um, so she had emergency surgery. They removed the tumor and the kidney. She did chemotherapy, and we thought she had it all behind her. Um, she was a very healthy girl. She was a championship dancer with uh, Trinity Irish Dancers. Mm -hmm. um, there's no cancer history in our family at all. Um, but the cancer came back rather quickly. Um, she had more intense treatment, a double stem cell transplant, high dose uh, lung radiation. Um, because it had metastasized to her lungs. Yeah. Um, during this time, um, she was still uh, going to high school, um, trying to be involved as, in as much as she could. Mm -hmm. um, she went to Elmhurst College, as I said before, and um, she became involved in Habitat for Humanity and a buddy program where she helped a special ed adult. And um, she was the um, president of the Student Nurses Association. She was going to nursing school so she could go to these other countries or even in our own country, help the people, and she wanted skills to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the cancer returned again her sophomore year of college. Um, so she did experimental treatments for two and a half years, continuing to fight to hope that a cure would be found. Um, but unfortunately, um, the last semester of her college education, she had to drop out of school. Um, the cancer was untreatable. Um, she was becoming um, much more ill, um, but she still had that big heart. She, a um, few days before she died, she was writing in a notebook things she wanted us to do. And later I read the notebook and it had a list of things. And on the very bottom, in all capital letters, she wrote, donate to feed my starving children each day. And that was amazing. And that, you know, was her message to us that she wanted us to continue on mm -hmm. to help others, even though she's not here to do it. And just to keep her legacy alive of, you know, doing what you can for others. Right. Um, you know, she always felt she was blessed, even though she was given a bad um, course in her life. Um, these children in other countries, they get cancer too. Mm -hmm. You know, they may never have diagnosis. They meant they probably don't have diagnosis. They don't have treatment. They don't have uh, pain relief medication. So Megan had discussed all this with us, mm -hmm. why she had the passion um, to help these people. And so we have uh, an event um, every April at her birthday with the 90 people celebrating her life and packing the food for um, the starving children, as mm -hmm. she would want us to do. Wow. And it's really cool because it's her um, college friends, high school friends, neighborhood friends, our friends, people that have followed her journey and mm -hmm. just want to come and help out. And everybody goes to the different cells to pack, and they, they don't go with their little group. They sporadically spread out, and they all talk and have a great time. Um, celebrating Megan's life and helping um, 
the poor as she would have wanted oh to. My. So we hope to do that forever. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. Yeah, and the, the Student Nurses Association at Elmhurst College, they have um, become very fond of Feed My Starving Children. Great. I speak to the student nurses there and they come and volunteer in Megan's memory also. So oh. we're very blessed and pleased that people are continuing uh, to remember our daughter yes. and to do what she loved to do. It's so mm -hmm. inspirational. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it's just an incredible story of how one person, right, can have an impact. And uh, in her memory now, um, people come year after year to, to reach other kids. Thank you so much for sharing that story with You're us welcome. and her beautiful picture. Yes. Um, Megan, wow, it's a great inspiration for all of us. So you must Thank sense you. her presence there when you're all, all together. Yeah. Yes, and we're very blessed to have had her for 22 years. Mm -hmm. We wish it was much more, but we know that we're going to be together again because God's promises are real. Are true. Yes, yes. they are. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's, God is not just at work in the foreign lands, is he? he he's at work mm. in the, at all the sites and among all the people whenever we're gathered in his name he says he promises us to be in the midst and, and that's what happens um and I, i'm so grateful that feed my starving children got back to their roots and mm -hmm. rededicated um their work uh so that it could go forward uh in such a powerful way it's just just great mm -hmm. um to hear oh so do you have any other like personal stories that you could share have you been uh, out in the uh, local sites at all like to where the food is being delivered or yeah about yeah. a year ago uh, in August mm -hmm. I um, I went down to, to Haiti mm -hmm. um, to visit one of our partners there called Mission of Hope and we spent about a week there with um, some of my coworkers and volunteers and friends and uh, and uh, it was a very powerful experience it was my first time um, uh, being in Haiti and mm -hmm. and uh, just um, wit witnessing um, kind of the poverty and and then seeing how the food the food helps uh, especially in places like schools or orphanages or, and and the different feeding programs mm -hmm. that the partners have mm -hmm. uh, have in those places they um we, we were lucky enough to see some shipments of, of some other food formulas we have the man manipak potato w and d i brought these as yeah. well tell us um, what, what those are about. these are these are a little newer like only a couple years old the manipak potato d was developed first and um this was developed specifically because one of the, the main causes of death uh, with children who are starving is dehydration mm. um, because they will get something like cholera and um, then they will have um, diarrhea and become dehydrated. And, okay. and so this is a, a special food formula specifically designed for kids um, who are suffering from um, severe diarrhea. And, it, and with um, so the combination of this and oral, oral rehydration therapy, it really can stop diarrhea completely. Wow. And so it works especially well in cholera camps, which you see a lot of in Haiti, um, since the earthquake especially. Mm -hmm. And when we made this, we saw a lot of younger kids um, being fed it as well, even though they didn't have the diarrhea. And we learned that another need is, is a formula of food for children who are weaning, who can't eat the rice yet, who are maybe oh. between seven and 12 months old, um, coming off of breastfeeding. And, um, and so we developed the Manipak Potato W formula um, for the younger kids who, like I said, can't eat the rice and, and, um, and, and who are at that weaning period. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so these are really cool, important new formulas. So we saw some of that when I was, when I was down in Haiti um, right at Mission of Hope and, mm -hmm. and that was just yeah a life changing experience. You you see you, you go you go thinking um, you're gonna help them and help give this food but it's I mean the Haitians really helped us and showed us showed us um, what faith is, what love is, what mercy and compassion and justice is in their in their um, in their worship and in their lives and I learned so much from them on that trip. It was wow. it was an amazing experience. Yeah, it mm -hmm. sounds like it yeah. makes me wanna go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you cooperate with, with organizations? Can people go on short-term mission trips um, with, through your packing sites? I mean, can, or it's not set up to go through our packing sites, yeah. but a lot of our, a lot of the uh, organizations we partner with yeah. um, uh, host, uh, they can host mission people? trips pretty frequently. 